Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, 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 thank you. Thank you. Yeshikol Chatham. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Gold. Here we are, Yeshiva Rabbi Akiva, for hosting us. And thank you, Gadi and Graham, for doing all the uh, preparations and recording and filming. Thank you all for coming. This week, Be'ez Hashem, we look forward to Parsha Lech Lecha. So before we actually get into the Parsha, I may just ask everybody, please, if you can, keep your cell phones off, but minds and hearts on and open. And we'll start with the opening sentence of the portion in uh, Lech Lecha 12-1, Vayom Hashem al Avram. And Hashem said to Avram, Lech Lecha Me'artzecha, go for yourself from your land, Umi Moladetcha, and from your birthplace, Umi Beisavicha, and from the house of your father, El Ha'aretz Asher Ar'eka, to the land that I will show you. Now I think we all share a common belief that the Torah is eternal. What does it mean to be eternal? It means that the Torah is applicable to all people in all times. We find the Mori Nayim in last week's Parsha Noach says just that. Hinei behold it is known, ki Torah nitzchis, the Torah is eternal, ubechol adam, and therefore it is relevant to all people. The Degel Machen Ephraim in this week's Parsha says, ki Torah nitzchis, the same words, the Torah is eternal, the yeshna bechol adam bechol zman. It applies to all people and in all times. It's really based on a verse. In Isaiah 40-8, Udvar Elokeinu Yokum La'olam. The Word of God will stand forever. What is the Word of God? It's the Torah. It lasts forever. What does that mean? Part of what it means is that it is relevant to all people in all times, which brings us to question number one. I understand how the opening sentence of this portion is applicable or was to Avram Avinu in his life experience. Question one is, how is this sentence relevant to you and I until this very day? Hashem told Avraham, Lech Lecha how does this verse speak to us until this very day? So Hevra, let's see a Zohar which understands this verse to be talking about something else entirely different. The Zohar Chadash, Medrash Ne'elam, different names for sections of the Zohar, in Lechacha, on page 30b says that when the Parsha begins with the words, Vayom Hashem al Avram, Hashem said to Avram, what it really means to say is that Hashem speaks to the soul. Yes, it's true, Hashem did speak to Avram Avinu. That's the simplistic read of the verse. However, the Torah is also telling us on a much deeper level that Hashem speaks to the soul. First of all, how do we know? Where do we see in the verse that Hashem is speaking to a soul? It says, Vayom Hashem el Avram. Hashem spoke to Avram. How do you spell Avram? Four Hebrew letters. And they are Aleph Bey's Reish Mem. If you split that name into two, you get two different words. The first half is Av, which means father, and the second half spells Ram, which means high and exalted. The Zohar says these are two descriptions of the soul. The soul has the Bechina, the essence or constitution of an Av. It's like a father. What is one of the father's primary roles? To teach his children. So therefore the soul is called an Av because one of its primary roles is to teach the body how to behave in this world. So we call the soul an Av. The soul is also referred to as Ram, which means high and exalted, because after all, the soul comes from a very high and exalted place. So according to the Zohar, when it says, Vayomer Hashem el Avram, it doesn't just mean Hashem spoke to Avram, although he did, but it also means simultaneously, Vayom Hashem, Hashem spoke to Avram. Hashem speaks to the soul, which is called an Av, and it is called Ram. What does Hashem say? To each and every soul, you have to keep reading. Which means there comes a point in the life of every soul that Hashem says to the soul, it's time to leave your land, meaning the heavenly domain. It is time to leave your birthplace, the place of your origin. It is time to leave your father's home. What's the, who is the soul's father? It's our father in heaven, Avinu Shabbat our parent in heaven. There comes a point in the life of every soul when God says to her, it's time to leave. Where am I going to? Keep reading. El Ha'aretz Asher Ar'eka, to the land that I will show you. Now, the Eretz can refer to planet Earth, which is an Eretz, it's a body of land. But more specifically, says the Zohar, Hashem tells every single soul, you're going to have to occupy a body because the body 
Where did the body come from? We just had recently the story of creation. The body is Afar Mino Adama. It's a derivative of the earth. So Hashem tells every single soul, at some point, it's now time to leave the heavenly domain. You're going to have to go into an Eretz. You're going to have to occupy your body. And when the verse goes on to say in verse 4, V'ayelach Avram, and Avraham went as Hashem had spoken to him. On the deeper level, it means that ultimately every soul obeys, every Avram obeys this directive of Hashem and goes down and does exactly what Hashem tells her to do. What comes out of this Zohar is that on the words of the opening sentence, El Ha'aretz Asher Ar Eka, go to the land that I will show you. We have at least this far two understandings of what the verse means. There is the pshat level, the simplistic level, the storyline of the parsha, and then we have the sod, the secretive level from the Zohar. In the pshat, the simplistic understanding, Hashem told Avraham, I want you to go to a land I share our echo that I will show you. One can deduce from that that at first Hashem did not reveal the nature of or the name of the country that he was going to. That is the pshat. On the sod, on the secretive level, according to the Zohar, Hashem tells every neshama, every soul, you're going to have to go to the Eretz, to the land, to the body that I will show you. One can deduce that at first Hashem does not reveal to the soul into which body it's going to occupy. And you know, Rashi on the Pshat level, Rashi in the Parsha, cites the Midrash from the Bereshus Rabbah, 39-9, on the words, Asher Areka, that I will show you. So what does Rashi say from the Midrash? Lo gila lo miyad. Hashem did not reveal which country it was going to be at first. And why did Hashem withhold that information from Avraham? So Rashi from the Midrash cites uh, a few reasons. First it says, In order to make Eretz Yisrael more beloved and more precious in Avraham's eyes. How does withholding the information make Eretz Yisrael more beloved? Because it's like giving a person a gift. If you take a gift out of the bag and show it to the person straight away, they can see what it is, okay, thank you. But if you have it wrapped in wrapping paper, and now it's in a box with the ribbon, and it's a whole ceremony, oh, so excited, take the ribbon, remove the cover, and take it, the whole buildup, the anticipation, it makes it more beloved. So that's, it makes, by not telling Avraham, oh, wow, well, what's this special land? That's one of the reasons. But Rashi from the Midrash goes on to say another reason why Hashem withheld the information from Avraham. It was in order to increase Avraham's reward for every word that Hashem commanded him to do, for every step, I'll call psia upsia, on every step that Avraham took, which means there's a parallel going on over here. That means on the deeper level, on the sod, from the Zohar, Hashem also does not reveal to any soul at first into which body it's going to occupy during what you and I call life. We only find that out later. Like Avraham found out later, the soul finds out later, which this information brings us to two other questions. Questions two and three. Question two is going to be on the pshat level, the simplistic read of the storyline. Question three will be on the sod, on the secretive level from the Zohar. Question two on the pshat is the second reason that Rashi gave. Rashi said, what's the second reason why Hashem withheld the information? In order to increase... Avraham's reward for every step that he takes. So question two is, what do you mean increase his reward? I think even if Hashem would have told Avraham from the get-go the name of the country, I still think he should have been rewarded tremendously. Why? Because let's, let's say Hashem said, okay, Avraham, you want to know the place? Okay, I'll spill the beans. It's called Kena'an. It's called Canaan. One day it's going to change its name to Yisrael after your grandson. Okay? Let's just say Hashem said that. So, 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 so therefore what? So Hashem told him the name. Do you think it's still not challenging to leave and go to this? Uh, Avram was still unfamiliar with the nature of that land. I mean, uh, what are the people like in this place? What's the weather like? Is there food? 
What, and if there is, what is it like? What's, what's the beverage like? There's so many questions. So, so be, even though it was, he was unfamiliar with the nature of the land, Avram still went just because Hashem told him to do so. I think he should get reward for every step just for that. So question two is, what tosefes sechar? What additional reward? is Avraham going to get just because he doesn't happen to know the name of the country. So what's in the name? And if he would have known the name, it diminishes his reward. That's question two on the pshat. Question three on the sod, on the secretive part of what's going on is, at the parallel is Hashem does not reveal at first to any neshama, to any soul, which body it's going to occupy. So question three is why? What's going on here? Is there a lesson to be gleaned from this piece of information? By the way, Hashem withholds information until it's time. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Well, why, why, why? Why not reveal to every soul what body to Is there a message? Is there a lesson? These chavra are the three questions that we are going to be dealing with today. Be'ezra Hashem. L'chaim. Let's begin with the teaching of the British of Arebi in his Kedusha Slevi on our Parsha Lechacha, which lays down a fundamental teaching. He says that when Hashem said to Avraham, El Ha'aretz Asher Ar Eka, to the land that I will show you, says the British of Rebbe, there is a tremendous lesson with respect to Avodas Hashem, to the service of God, that's buried in these words. And that message is that every single one of us must know that all of our journeys in life, in this world, from the first breath that we breathed at the time of birth until the last breath that we take on the other end of life, with the time we return our souls to their maker, we have to realize that every single journey in life, they are all masturin. What does that mean? They are all hidden from us. What does that mean to say? It means that nobody knows what lies ahead. We've got no idea what's lurking around the corner. We've got no idea. Nobody knows. In the journeys of life, we have different stages of life and different experiences in life. Nobody knows if this path is going to be easy or is it going to be hard. In the new chapter that I begin, am I going to have an aliyah from this? Will I be uplifted from this experience? Or am I going to have a yuri? Am I going down? We have no idea. Nobody knows if the path is going to be straight or is it going to be crooked. Nobody knows the unique nisyonos, the unique challenges that await us like an obstacle course. We have got no idea what to expect and nobody knows what the tikkun is supposed to be. What are we supposed to fix <laughs> when I'm found in that place, in that uh, whatever? What's my mission? What's my purpose? What do I have to mend and repair? What's my job? We've got no idea what's ahead. All this information remains with Hashem. Hashem withholds that information from us. However, says the Berdich of Rebbe in this week's parsha, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, was maftiach, God promised and guaranteed Avraham, but it wasn't just a promise to Avraham. He says it was a guarantee to all of Avraham's descendants, that's you and I and all of us. What was the promise? The promise was, El Ha'aretz Asher Ar Eka, to the land that I will show you. In other words, Hashem was saying to Avraham and to all of us, don't worry, I'm going to bring you to your destinations. Don't worry, I'm going to show you the way. You've got no idea what's ahead. You're all in doubt, you're in the dark. Don't worry, Hashem says, I've got your back. I'm right next to you, I'm holding your hand. And don't worry, I will be with you, guiding you on the proper path that you and I, that we need to take in the journeys of our lives. And Hashem promises us, I'm going to give you the kochos, the strength to persevere, overcome, and grow from the experiences that lie ahead of you. Hashem says, I will bring you to those destinations. You will wind up fulfilling the missions for which I sent you on those specific 
specific paths. And therefore, says the Shvili Pinchas, based on this prediction for Rebbe, we already have an answer to question number one. We wanted to know, how does the opening sentence of this week's parasha, how is it relevant to all people in all times? It's time to leave. Time to leave your birthplace, your origins, your home, to the land that I'm going to show you. We can already see it is extremely relevant to every single one of because before every single birth, every single soul hears those words from Hashem. Okay. The time has come. Lech lecha me'artzecha. I know you love it up here. I know you're in ecstasy. I know you feel secured and safe and loved and cozy and warm. And it's true. But there comes a time. Your soul heard it. My soul. We all heard it. Hashem said the time has come. Lech lecha me'artzecha. We all heard that we had to abandon, at least temporarily, the heavenly domain. And every single soul hears those words from Hashem. El ha'aretz asher ar eka. You're going to occupy your body. Which body? Don't worry. Hashem says, I will show you precisely which body it is that you are going to occupy. Not now, but I will. I will. And just like at the beginning of a soul's journey, it's completely in the dark. She doesn't know into which body, into which family she's going to be born. That sets the pace and paves the way for the rest of that soul's journey throughout life. That means at every crossroad, we've got no idea. We've got no idea what's going to happen. We have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. Does anybody know? Nobody knows. We've got no idea what the next moment is going to bring. We've got no idea what lies ahead of us. It sets the pace. The soul was in the dark when it first made its descent into this world. Throughout life, we're always in the dark. We've got no idea what's really going to happen today. We have no idea. There are no guarantees. But just like at the end of the day, every soul arrives in the body that's perfect for her, because that's what Hashem decreed. That's the perfect body for you. That's the perfect family for you. It's the perfect situation for you. The lesson is, throughout life, eventually we will all arrive at the perfect places for us. We'll be involved in those situations and circumstances that are perfect for us. This is extremely relevant to every single person in every single generation in all times. And Hashem guaranteed Avraham and guarantees all of us. Hashem will direct us to the right path. Hashem will reveal to us, not right now, but eventually we'll see exactly where it is that we have to be. We'll understand, we'll have clarity what it is we have to be involved in and we'll start to realize what it is that God sent us to these places for. L'chaim. Now, there's a Midrash that supports this whole idea. It's found in Abrashis Rabbah in 53-14. It's in Parshas Vayera. What's the storyline? Well, Avraham had kicked Hagar and her son Yishmael out of the house. And Yishmael had a very high fever. Avraham gave them only one loaf of bread, one canteen of water, and he kicked them out. They go to the desert and he's drinking and drinking. He's in a high fever and before, not before long, there's no water left. And they're in a desert and he's thirsty and he's very sick and she thinks he's gonna die. She's, she throws him under the bushes. She sits beside herself. That's the story. Now the truth is, she thought her son was going to die because the water ran out. Unbeknownst to her, she was sitting right on top of a well of water. But she didn't know. So that's where the verse kicks. The verse in Parshas Vayera, next week's Parsha, in 21-19 says, Vayifkach elukim eseineha. And then God opened her eyes. God opened Hagar's eyes. And she saw a well of water. Now, it was there the entire time. She just didn't notice it. And then Hashem opened her eyes. Oh, look at that. There's a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water. And she gave the youth a drink. And she saved her son's life. There's a famous midrash on these words. And maybe you've heard it before. I'm going to read the words. I'll tell you why in a moment it's so famous. Omer Rebbe Binyamin. Rabbi Binyamin says, Hakol Becheskasumin. Everybody has a chazaka. What's a chazaka? A presumed status quo of sumin. Everybody's blind. Oh, blind. Chasfashalim, God forbid. But you know something the Midrash says? Everybody is blind to a degree. 
Ad shahakadosh baruchu meir es einehem. Until God illuminates their eyes. How do we know? Says the midrash. Min hacha from here. What does it say here in this verse? I'll say it again. Vayifkach elokim es einehem. Hashem opened her eyes. There she was. I mean, physically speaking, Hagar was able to see, but she was blind to the water. Until Hashem said, the time has come for me to open her eyes. Oh, there it is. And she went to the water and gave her son to drink. You know why this much is, Midrash is a famous Midrash? This is the Midrash that people use as a segula to find lost items. So when the wife says, oh, where did my earrings go? What happened to, I, I could have sworn rummaging through the bags. Right? Can't find it, right? So people take out the midrash. Get yourself, I'm sure you have, get yourself a, a bracious rabba. I'll tell you where it is again. 53-14. Put your bookmark in there. 53-14 in a bracious rabba. And you take out, you read these words, and you like... Turn to Hashem. Hashem, open my eyes. People have sworn by this segula. Two minutes later, they wind up finding the lost objects that they have lost. In any case, what do you see? What do we see from this? As the Shvili Pincha says, we learn from this Midrash. What was Hagar looking for? Looking for water. It teaches us that if you and I, if any one of us, if we're looking for water, and by extension, if we're looking for sustenance. So let me say it this way. If we're looking for parnasa for a livelihood. Or maybe we're looking for a shidduch, for a soulmate. Maybe we're looking for a refua, some type of healing. Maybe a yeshua, some type of salvation, whatever the circumstances might be. We have to realize at first we're all beches kasumen. We're all blind. We've got no idea. May I in Yavo Ezri, from where is my salvation going to come? Where is my... But you know what? We have to remember. According to the B'tach of Rebbe, there is a haftacha, there is a guarantee and a promise in this week's parasha, not just to Avraham, but to all of Avraham's descendants. Don't worry, I've got your back. El ha'aretz asher ar eka. You're going to get there. You're going to get the parnasa, you're going to get the shidach. You're going to get the refua, you're going to get the yeshua. It's all going to happen. Just bear with me. It's going to be okay. And I think this answers question number three. The reason why, why doesn't Hashem reveal to, to any soul, into which body, to which family it's going to occupy for the duration of what you and I call life. Why? Hashem is teaching every neshama. By the way, that means us. You know, we are basically souls. There's a great expression in Hebrew. People often refer to each other as a soul. You ever hear the people say, Eze neshama. Huh? People speak, it's a beautiful Israeli quote. What a neshama, what a soul that person is. We're more our souls than our bodies, right? So Hashem is teaching every so, meaning Hashem teaches all of us that, remember, just like at the beginning of your descent into this world, that beginning of the journey, you had no idea where you were going. But at the end, you wound up in the perfect place for you. It's a lesson for life. Throughout the duration of life, we've got no idea. So many chapters in life. Uh, do we know? When we were younger, do we know? Okay, what, what, what my career is going to be? We had no idea. There were times where we were like, you know, back and forth. What do I, what, 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 what do I take? And which credits? And we don't, we don't know. Do, did we know who we were going to marry? Did we know if we would have children and what they would turn out like? You know, Parnassa, so many questions. Hashem says that's the way your journeys are going to be throughout life. At first, you're going to know nothing. Absolutely nothing. But don't worry, Hashem says, I'll bring you to those places. You will find all, eventually it's all going to happen. It's all, and people wind up finding their places of work and they find up winding their soulmates. They find up having children or whatever the case. Eventually, eventually. But why does Hashem do it? Why did Hashem create a system like that for? And the reason why Hashem created such a system, as opposed to let everybody know from the get-go what's, what's ahead. You know why it's this way? You know why we cannot know in advance? It's because this system that Hashem created builds our emuna. It builds our faith. Because, we do, because of the uncertainties, because we don't know, because we're in so much doubt all the time about so many things, what if? So it, it helps us look heavenward, reach out to God, 
for assistance and it builds our emuna. It builds our, we have to flex those, those emuna muscles and it keeps us in touch with Hashem. L'chaim. And that's what I think the answer to question number two is. That's why Hashem withheld the information from Avram to which country he was going to go to. So, why like Rashi said in the second reason from the Midrash, because in order to increase his reward for every step that he took, we asked, and what if Hashem would have spilled the beans? Okay, it's Canaan. Okay, it's going to be called Eretz Yisrael. Do you think he would have not been rewarded? Well, of course he would have been rewarded. But even he knows the name. <laughs> he doesn't know the nature of the place. He's unfamiliar. So he's still going, following only because Hashem said so. But you know what the additional reward was to Avraham? By not even revealing to him the name of the country? That means, think about it. It means that Avraham had absolutely no idea where he was going. No idea. Think about how much we prepare in advance before we take a trip. Think about that, right? Wow, OMG, what we do for a trip. Months in advance, booking tickets, we've got to know everything. Which airport, which airline, what time? Is that American time, is that Israeli time? I don't know, sure. And what happens when, had the stopover, exactly how long? Which, what terminal, what gate? With so many, everything, the itinerary. It's got, we got to know everything. Hash, I, you have to imagine, Avra must have come home that day. <laughs> uh, Sarah, Lot, Hevra, all the people, all this Hasid, he was Makarev, pack your bags, we're going. Oh, so exciting. I could just see they're taking their suitcases out, they're packing their things, and by the way, and, and where are we going? And Avram says, I've got absolutely no idea. Uh, what's that? <laughs> where are we going? I don't know. Oh, one second, when I get out the front door, do I make a right or a left? I don't know, but we're going. We're going. Could you imagine? Not even, not even to know the place. You got to imagine, would anyone do that today? You just, okay, you just wait, just pick yourself up, take out your luggage, start packing things, and walk out. Just, where are you going? I'm going on a trip. To where? Don't know. I'm just going, you know. It's, it's almost like, what? Avraham went, and he, his whole, he uprooted himself. I'm sure he was settled. He uprooted himself with his family, with his people, and he just started to go. You know what, you know what, how that increases Avraham's reward? See, had he known, okay, Canaan, get a map, Okay, I see it's right over there. At least he would walk with confidence, I'm going in the right direction. Right? But he has no idea. North, south, west, east. Every step that Avraham takes, he must be wondering, am I still going in the right place? Every moment he has to look heavenward, Hashem, please lead me in the path, the direction I'm supposed to be going. In other words, by not knowing even the name of the place, it increases Avraham's reward because Avraham's emuna, his faith in God, was strengthened. He had to place his trust in Hashem, that Hashem is going to... Hashem just said, go. I'm going. I, what if it's the opposite? Hashem will work it out, that eventually I'm going to arrive at the desired destination. That increased his reward. So therefore, this is something that Hashem guarantees all of us. According to the B'dit of Rebbe, it's a guarantee to all of Avraham's descendants. Don't worry. Everything is going to work out in the end. L'chaim. Now, the Shvili Pinchas, yes? When you're referring to souls, I mean, my Chabad friends say only Jews have a second soul, or just a Jewish soul. Everybody else is just an animal soul. I mean, you're talking about just Jews? So, this, this is an excellent question. Uh, yes, there is a difference in the type of soul that a Jew has and a non-Jew has. But non-Jews also have souls. Non-Jews also have missions. Mm -hmm. There's a purpose for why God created non-Jews. Just like there's a reason why God created the animals and the trees. And every blade of grass has a purpose and function in Hashem's grand scheme of things. And, um, and yes, that means it applies to everybody. Everybody has a mission to carry out. So therefore, this is a very global uh, lesson that we are sharing right now. Now, the Shvili the, the, the Pincha says this is a great, theoretically, this is great. In other words, it's a very great promise. It's very comforting. I feel very secure that don't worry, everything's going to work out at the end. However, he says, You see, sometimes 
we engage in in sin. I know this is a very you know ra- a subject that people are unfamiliar with because it happens such a rare occasion, sinning, making mistakes, something which most of us probably don't even engage in, right? So so but but there are people that from time to time they wind up making mistakes. Now, what does sin do? Sin, our sins, create mechitzos. They create barriers. Barriers and partitions that separate between ourselves and God. It puts distance between us. How do we know this? It's what it says in Isaiah 59-2. Ki im avonoseichem hayu mavdilim beinechem lebeinelokechem. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. There it is in Isaiah But not only does sin put distance between ourselves and Hashem, it puts distance between ourselves and God's promise. El ha'aretz asher ar'ekka. Don't worry. I'll send the signal down the right path you have to go on. Now, Hashem sends signals, but what if there's interference? What if there's no reception? There are iron curtains, and there are barriers, and partitions, and so on. So maybe we're not receptive. See, that's what that's the problem is. How can we benefit or cash in on this guarantee if we've created these, these barriers? So what's the Yetzirah? What's the advice? I'd love to be able to benefit from this, from this divine guarantee. The Yetzirah is something called tshuva. Repentance. Tshuva should not be something we only do at one time of the year. Okay, Elo, half of Tishrei, okay. It's got to be, if we sin from time to time or along the way, we have to be ready to do tshuva along the way as well. What does tshuva do? Tshuva erases sin. Guess what happens when sin gets erased? Those partitions and barriers disappear. And we are open, the channels are open to receive these signals from Hashem and eventually the crystallization and the, re- the realization, oh, now I see exactly how things are panning out and what it is that I need to be doing. Not only is there tshuva, there's something called tefillah. Prayer is a tool that we have at our disposal which has the power at breaking through the chomos habarzel, the walls of iron, right? And there are even tfilos like that that express this idea that prayer has the power to break down and therefore through tshuva and through tefillah which are often connected we can remove the sin, remove the barriers and then the channels are once again open. We are receptive to receive these divine signals. L'chaim. So practically speaking, and we're not finished yet, but just already, practically speaking, when we find ourselves in a dilemma, and we find ourselves at crossroads, and we're not sure what to do, we should regularly um, be involved in the following exercise. It's called talking to Hashem in our own language, and we should say something along the following lines. Hashem, I am so sorry for the sins I've committed in the past. Please forgive me and please give me the strength to never repeat them again. So I'm I'm davening to God, I'm talking to Hashem, but it's also tshuva, there's repentance in this tefillah. And then we have to invite God in and continue to say, Dear God, I am at a crossroad right now. I've got no idea what to do. Please, dear God, lead me in the direction that I am supposed to take, just as you led my great-grandfather Avraham. And this is a piece of advice. And this is like a segula. It works like a charm to remove sin, remove the barriers, closeness, reception, and then hopefully then we can cash in and benefit from this divine guarantee that Hashem gave to Avraham and all of his descendants. Now, it would be appropriate at this stage to share a teaching from the Shalah, which fits into this entire lesson. We go back to Parshas Baaloscha. In Baaloscha, in 9-18, it talks about the Jewish people in the desert and how they traveled from place to place and then they encamped. Now, How did the people even know when it was time to travel, when it was time to encamp? How how did they even know? So here's where the verse kicks. The verse tells us, According to the word of Hashem, they would journey. And according to the word of Hashem, they would encamp. 
You know how they knew when to go, when to stop. God said go, they went. God said stop, they stopped. That's how they knew. So the Shalah there in Baloscha, Derech Chaim Tochachas Musar, says it's a tremendous lesson to extrapolate from that, from that sentence, from that Pasuk. And the message is, says the Shalah, before and after every undertaking, before and after every project, before and after every journey, a person should regularly say, either im Yirza Hashem or Be'ezras Hashem, with the assistance of God, with the help of God. Which means, for example, before a person goes out, you're going on a journey, maybe there's a project you've been working on, right? Before going, one should say, I am now going to do such and such an activity, but it's Be'ezras Hashem. I am going to do this with the help of God. And after coming home, after accomplishing what we set out to do at the end of the day, we should also say what I accomplished today was Be'ezras Hashem. Credit Hashem. It was with the assistance of How does the Shulah see that that's what a person should do regular from, from the words? Because it says in the verse, Al pi Hashem Yisu, Al pi Hashem Yachanu. Now the translation was that according to the word of God, they journeyed and according to the word of God, they encamped. But there's an alternative translation to the words, a very literal read. I'll say it slow. Al pi, on my mouth, Al pi, on my mouth, Hashem. I will mention Hashem Yisu when I travel. Al pi on my mouth, Hashem. I will mention God's name, Yachanu, when I get back home. It might be easier at the beginning of the day. You know, you start off a day, you leave the house. Nice to say, I am now going about my day. But Ezra said, you know why it's easier at the beginning of the day? Because let's say I have a, a huge deal to close. I'm not sure how it's going to pan out. I'm not sure. It can go sideways and turn sour, right? So I could see myself feeling vulnerable at the beginning of the day. You know what? I'm going to Ezra Hashem, like, you know, hoping that Hashem makes it happen. What happens if the deal goes through? You made millions in one shot. Now you come home and share it with your family, right? So now, it's, a, it's maybe a bigger challenge, right? Now people sometimes tend, they're relaxed, sitting back in their home, and sometimes the guy says to us, you should have seen me, wow, I'm such a social butterfly, woo, the jokes that I cracked, I had them in the palm of my hand. Wow, he starts crediting himself, my cleverness and my suggestion, wait a second. Al pi Hashem yachanu. What I did today was the Ezra's Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Hashem made it happen. And a person should regularly accustom oneself. And that's what the verses are teaching us. L'chaim. Shvili Pinchas takes this shalah and he connects it to the Bredich of a Rebbe we had before. They complement each other. Because the mere fact that a person, before and after every undertaking, before and after every project or journey, just accustoms oneself to saying, Be'ezras Hashem, fulfilling the verse, Al-Pi Hashem, this is the greatest segula, works like a charm, to connect to God, to break all the barriers. You know, when a person, if a person does this exercise, a person is constantly living with God. There are no barriers. Just by saying, I mean, not just to say it, but to think it, to feel it, to mean it, living with God, Be'ezras Hashem. That, that itself breaks the barriers. Close to Hashem. Once the barriers have been removed, now we can benefit from this divine guarantee. El Ha'aretz Asher Arak. I'm going to bring you. I'm going to bring you to the place that you need. It's going to work out. It's going to be fine. I got your back. I'm, at your, I'm holding your hand. It's going to be fine. And this is, so let's just kind of recap. Where are we holding so far? So far we've seen that the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu chooses to be manhig, why does God choose to guide the Jewish people with this hanhaga, with this specific way of expressed by the words El Ha'aretz Asher Areka, to the land that I'm going to show you in the future. It's in order that we, you and I, we should all come to realize that every step of life that we take, every step that we take in the journeys of our lives, we are completely dependent on Chasdei Hashem. Completely dependent on Hashem's kindness. And by having this awareness, it strengthens our emuna. It strengthens our faith and putting our trust in Hashem. Now, why do we need to strengthen our faith? You'll say, what do you mean, why? Uh, Emunah is one of the foundations. Emunah bitachon is the olive base, isn't it? 
Aleph Beis. Aleph for Emuna, Beis for Bitachon. It's the Aleph Beis. It's the ABCs. So there doesn't have to be a reason, but I'll tell you, you know, you know something? Yes, Emuna, Bitachon, faith and trust in God is, is necessary on its own right, but you know something? It leads to something. Our faith in God leads to the purpose of everything. The purpose as to why God created the world, the purpose behind the entire Torah, the purpose behind every mitzvah. What's it all about? Yeah, I remember, I learned, I remember learning something about Hilchos Shabbos, something about Bishel and Borer and Muksa. Yeah, why, why, why? Why does Hashem, why does Hashem care about how I extract that watermelon pit? Why? Everybody say, why? What's God, why, why? What does it bother God, right? Mezuzah, why mezuzah? Matzah, why? Sukkot we just had, why? Lulav, why? Who need, why? Why? What's it all about? Sitzis, tefillin, what's a why? If you had to boil it down to one word, there's only one word that truly explains the point of it all. And that one word is tveikus, which means to cleave, to cling, to connect with Hashem. At the end of the day, you know what it's all about? It's about building a relationship with God. That is the end game. That's the goal. That's the result of all the mitzvahs that we do. And you know, we find this in a Gemara. Now, if I were to ask you, pass around the microphone, which I can't do because it's kind of caught up in my shirt over here. But if I were to do this and ask you, okay, Chevra, how many mitzvahs do we have in the Torah? Does anybody know? Say it out loud. 613. Yes, 613. Now I ask you, how do you know? Uh, not really sure how I know that. I think I remember hearing that somewhere. Some rabbi or somebody, I read it in some book somewhere. How did the rabbi know? I don't even know. How did you teach? I don't know. How do, we, how do you know? Did you ever wind up counting? Anyone, sit, anyone here in the room sit down and count every mitzvah? Would you like to know how we know there were 613? I'll tell you how we know. It's a Gemara at the end of Mesechet Makos. The end of the third chapter, Elohein Alokin, it's the end of the last chapter. It's on pages 23b to 24a. Dorash Rebbe Samloi. Rebbe Samloi expounded the following thing. Sheish meos ushloshes re mitzvos ne'em rulo Moshe. Hashem told Moshe at Sinai 613 commandments. So that's how we know. You might ask, how does he know? We'll get to that in a, in a second. We'll ask that in a moment. He said, before... Before getting the, the ultimate source, although Rabbi Samuel could be a source, but before his source, right, the Gemara begins to break down the 613. The Gemara says, The 365 negative commands from the 613, they correspond to the days in a solar year, 365. The 248 positive commands of the 613. What do they correspond? They correspond to the 248 limbs of a person. Okay. After break, that's why. 248, 363, 613. The Gemara now asks our question. L'chaim. Micra. How do you know? Rabbi Samoy, how do you know there are 613 mitzvahs? Is there like a source to that? Is there a pasuk to that? And the Gemara says, yes, it's a pasuk. It is a verse. We just had it three weeks ago. Parshas Vizos Bracha. Simchas Torah. There it was. In Vizos Bracha 33-4, you know what the pasuk is? It says clearly, Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe. Moshe commanded us in the Torah. There it is. Well, before that as well, well um, Yaakov, when he said to, to Esau, he said, I need love and guard you. Correct. Right. Love and guard thee. Correct. Correct. But he, so this Pesach says, Torah tziva lanu Moshe. Moshe commanded us in the Torah. Clear as day. Don't you see it? 613, right there on the page. What? I'm looking at, I'm cross eyed I'm looking, did I miss something? I'm missing a sentence or a word? Where do you see 613 in that Pasuk? So, the Gemara says like this. The word Torah. What is the numerical value of the word Torah? People call it 613. No, it's wrong, not 613. The Gematri of the word Torah is 611. Now watch how the Gemara now reads that Pasuk differently. Torah, or shall I say 611, Sivalana Moshe. 
Moshe commanded us in 611. However, there were two commandments that we heard from God directly at Sinai. First two of the Ten Commandments. Number one, I am Hashem your God. Number two, there may not be any other gods in my presence. So, if Moshe taught us 611, and we already heard two from, so 611 plus two in higher mathematics, 613, that's how we know. That's it. Anyone asks you, how do you know? Azoi shteit in teira. The Pasuk says, the Torah says, 600, that's Rabbi Sam even knew. That's what the Pasuk says. Now, unfortunately, the Gemara does not go on to list what those 613 mitzvahs actually are. It leaves it. Which just parenthetically opens the Pandora's box for all the Moneha mitzvahs, all the mitzvah counters. Got everybody counting now, because the, the Gemara said, the, the Torah says 613. So the Rambam counts, the Ramban, Maimonides, Nachmanides, the Sma, the Smag, right? You have the Dechinoch, the Chavetz the everyone's counting. And you know something? The lists don't match. <laughs> Everyone gets 613, but it's a different list, right? It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Like, you know, then you have to, like, what? wait a second, right? Like, the Ramban, Nachmanides, will say to Maimonides, in his, looks at the Sefer Hamitzvahs of Maimonides, you read it from cover to cover, it doesn't mention Yishu Veretz Yisrael as being one of the mitzvahs, living in the land of Israel. It's not mentioned there. So Nachmanides says, <coughs> excuse me, Rabbeinu, <laughs> I think you forgot. The myths are living in the land. So many verses are living in the land, right? So now, what do you, now why didn't the Rambam list that mitzvah, right? This is, I'm, I'm being serious. The Rambam doesn't, so now the Rambam can't defend himself because the Rambam lived before the Rambam. So, so others will defend. So whatever the, whatever the answer is, once you get the answer, then you turn to Nachmanides, then why did you list it? Right? You go back and forth, it's it complicated now, right? We could spend our whole lives probably learning, right? The 613 mitzvahs, what, 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 you know, the Rambam himself in Sefer HaMitzvahs has prefaces, they're called the Shrashag HaMitzvahs, the roots of the mitzvahs, prefaces, before I begin counting, we've got to define what's a mitzvah. What are the parameters of a mitzvah? You're going to count, count, count what? what? What are you counting? There could be different types, and how do you define them? So there are all these prefaces, Maimonides has to, before we begin to embark on this journey, we have to know all these rules of thumb. It's not zelo kakach pashot. Anyway, let's get back to the Gemara. The Gemara leaves out the list of 613, but then the Gemara says a fascinating thing. The Gemara says, Bud David came along King David and said, well, you know, 613 mitzvahs is a little too difficult for most people to concentrate on all the time. They get too overwhelmed. So King David said, you know what? Let's tell people to focus on just 11 mitzvahs. Not to dismiss all 613 or the other ones, but just let them focus on 11 and through those 11, they'll, it'll bring them to fulfill all 613. And he doesn't list which 11. He doesn't have a chance to because the Gemara writer says, by Yeshaya came Isaiah the prophet and said, you know, I think 11 is too hard for people to concentrate on at the same time. Vemidan al sheish. Let's just six. Let's just tell people at first, concentrate on these. Are they the six timidios? I don't know. He doesn't list. But uh, concentrate on these six and through those six, eventually they'll keep everything. Before, th then Bo Micha, came Micha the prophet. You see, no, six is too hard. People can't handle six things. Hamidan al Shalosh. Just focus on three things which will lead them to all 613. Chazar Yeshaya. Isaiah came. It's almost like a race. Isaiah came back. He said, you know what? I changed my mind from the six that I suggested. I don't think people, even your three, I think is too much thinking about it. Let's just tell people, keep two things and just though from those two, it'll lead to every, and then until Habakkuk the prophet came along and said, you know what? People can't concentrate on two things at the same time. Only on one thing at a time. Tell people just to focus on one thing, that one thing will bring them to everything. What's the one thing? Shene'emar, like it says in the book of Habakkuk in 2-4, V'tzadik be'emunoso yichyeh. The righteous person lives through his faith. The one thing that we should focus on is emuna, as that will lead to everything. On this Gemara, the Maharal says, in Chidushi Agados and in Teferis Yisrael, chapter 55, and the Toldos Yaakov Yosef and Vayishlach, number 8, says, they all say that the reason why 
Habakkuk boiled it down to emuna is because emuna, faith, brings us to dveikos. That's what the commentaries say. Faith in Hashem brings us to dveikos Bashem. We cleave and cling, we attach ourselves to God. We build a relationship. That's what it's all about. We find this is how the, the commentaries, this Gemara, we are learning that when you boil it down, it's all about dveikos Bashem. L'chaim. The Zohar, also, the Zohar in Parshas Vayishlach on page 170b also tells us, uh, shows us that it's all about Dveikos. Because what does the Zohar say? The Zohar says, yes, we have 248 positive commandments. Why 248? Because they correspond to 248 limbs of a body. Well, the Gemara, we, we just saw that in the Gemara. We had that in Makos. The Zohar goes on to say that the 365 negative commandments correspond to the 365 sinews of the person, which is unlike the Gemara in Makos. We said before from Makos, 365 correspond to 365 days in a solar year. Let's take the Zohar right now. These numbers are not arbitrary. Why are there 613 mitzvahs? Not 614, not 611. There's 613. Why? Why that number? And the breakdown, it's not random. 248, 365, why not 400 and whatever? Why dafka these numbers? Because they correspond the limbs of the person, they correspond the sinews, says the Zohar. This comes to teach us that the point, the goal of all the mitzvahs is that every aver, every limb of our bodies should be connected to God. Every sinew should be connected to God. It's all about dveikus Bashem. It's all about connecting to have that relationship with Hashem. And through Dveikos, once we achieve Dveikos, then Chevra, you and I are going to live forever. Once we connect with the Eternal One, we take on the properties of the Eternal One and we wind up living forever in this life and then in life after life. How do we know? Like it says in Vos Chanon 4-4 But you who cling to Hashem your God Chaim Kolchem Hayom You are all alive today and every single day. Righteous people never die. Wicked people are called dead even when they're alive. Righteous people are called alive even after what you and I call death because it's life after life. There is no death. We want to cash in on eternity. We have the, the dve, dveikos is the way to do it. What is the mahos? What is the essence of dveikos? Says the Shvide Pinchas, the essence of dveikos is the awareness to know that all of my successes are only dependent on Hashem. When I realize that everything that I do, everything that I accomplish, at no matter my, for everything, I am completely dependent on it. That is Dveikos. Every moment, every situation, every experience, I am dependent on God solely. And then I'm, I'm connected to because the moment, the moment a person starts to credit himself for his accomplishments. Wow, how clever I am. I'm pretty ingenious right there. He said, I'm strong, I'm fast, I'm good looking, whatever the case is. He starts to, as if he is the source of ideas. The person thinks he's the source of all of his strengths and talents, right? The person falls, unfortunately, under the category of what it says in Akev in 8-17. My strength and my might. The might of my hand has made me all of this wealth. And once a person gets into that mindset that it's me, I'm the one that closed the deal, I made it happen, that person winds up drifting very far away from Hashem. It's not God that brought me here. I brought me here. Hashem says, you know what? Then Hashem says to that person, I will leave you to your own devices and let's see how far that gets you eventually. Let's see where that road leads to eventually. And so therefore, Hevra, just to answer the second question again with a little bit more, L'chaim. Hashem did not reveal at first to Avraham to which country he was going to. You want to know why? Because had Hashem revealed the name of the country to Avraham, Avraham would not have felt as dependent on Hashem in every step that he took. I see where I'm going. I see the map. I see the direction. And you walk with confidence. And that would have weakened his emuna in Hashem, his faith and his dveikus Hashem. So Hashem very wisely withheld that information. Start going. 
go. You mean just go? Like, where am I going? You just go. I'll be right there with you. So now, Avram is forced into a situation where every step, he's looking heavenward, like, am I okay? Am I still on? The, I, I look to Hashem for direction constantly. And that yearning, that pining, is so beautiful. The Sfas Emes in our parsha Lech Lecha says that this is the way it is when it comes to Divri Torah, when it comes to the words of Torah. Baruch Hashem, here we are sitting around the table, we dedicate uh, much of our lives to the study of Torah. And so we appreciate the Torah. We see the Torah, wow, it's so vast, it's so deep, it's so sweet, it's so delicious, so beautiful. Now we're hungry. I, I want to know Torah. I want to know Torah. So what happens? We're learning something. So imagine we're learning Bechavrus or whatever, have a study partner. I'm learning, I'm learning. And for some reason, I'm having a hard time understanding, right? The language barrier. And then, and then it's, even if I get the translation, it's very cryptic. How do you, how to, you know, decode the, whatever's going on, decipher the coding, right? And, and so I, I have a, I'm banging my head against the wall. I, I can't understand. What are they talking about? You know what a person should do from time to time? You, you, you come like hit a dead end. You stop learning for a moment. You take out a Tehillim. And you start davening to Hashem for Siyat HaDeshmaya. You take out a Tehillim, you start saying some, some davening, and then you can say, Hashem, Hashem, please, please, I'm trying to understand your word, please, please. So then, so I'm yearning, I'm, pie, I'm longing, Hashem, please. Then you get back to learning, and of course, what happens eventually? You see, you apply yourself, you work, and then, Eureka! I've got it! Whoa! Whoa! Whoa, it all fits together! Now, Sfasemes says, what should a person do as soon as one acquires uh, a piece of Torah? Right away internalize it. How is it relevant to my life? How can I grow from this piece of information? That's a, but says the Sfasemes, greater than acquiring the Torah knowledge was the yearning, the pining, and the longing for that knowledge. You hear this? Greater than, after I own it, Greater than owning it was the process that brought me there. The longing, the pining, the why is that greater than? Because it's that yearning which brings me closer to Hashem. Constantly. To, so after I, I own the piece of Torah and I apply it and I internalize, what should a person do right away? Move to the next subject matter that I'm less familiar with and go back to yearning, pining, and longing all over again. There is beauty in the uncertainties. There is beauty in the doubt. It helps us turn to Hashem for assistance, and that's the most beautiful thing. We achieved vacus as a result of our turning to Hashem in that way. So before concluding, Chavra, there's just one more piece of advice given to us by the Baal Shem Tov what a person should do when a person finds oneself in a predicament or in a dilemma at crossroads l'chaim. If we don't know what to do, we are in doubt. What should I do? The situation came up at work, at the home, whatever. What should I do? The Baal Shem Tov, and he cites, the Baal Shem Tov in Kesser Shem Tov, number, number six, he cites the Ramban, Nachmanides, who was a great Kabbalist as well, says the Segula is that we have to learn sometimes how to take ourselves out of the situation. Sometimes we're too invested in something. There's too much of me in there. In other words, too much of me. Maybe I've got money on the line. Maybe I've got uh, pleasure on the line. Maybe it's my ego on the line. And I'm too, and once a person is too involved, it's so easy to permit or to forbid, to, 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 to cater to what I want. So the Baal Shem Tov says, take ourselves out of, this, out of the project. You have to kind of resolve ourselves. All right, I'm out. I don't care anymore. Yeah, you have to make up, we have to make up our minds. I'm out of here. I don't care anymore which way it goes. I don't care. I'm out. I don't care about the money. I don't care about this. Forget my ego. I'm out. Now, once I'm out, from an objective point of view, let me see what the proper thing should be to do in this situation. Objectively, I'm, I'm out of this. Forget it, I'm giving up all my money. It's all going to charity. I just want, so objectively, how do we know this is uh, one of the segulos to, to arrive at crystallization as to what to do? There's a verse in Parshas Devarim 1-17. V'hadavra asher yiksha mikem. Moshe said to the people, any matter that is too difficult for you, takrivun elai, you will bring to me ushmativ and I will hear it. So the Baal Shem says, rewind and play that verse again, but we're going to stop and put interpretation. You're going through something, it's kasheh, it's hard. You're in the dark, I'm in the dark, we don't know. 
You know why we don't know? Because of the next word, Mikem. It came from us. We don't know what to do because it's our own fault. I'm too invested. I've got my ego on the line. I've got my money on the line. I've got my other pleasures on the line. I can't come to, a, to a, an honest decision. So what's the Eitzah? Moshe says to us, Takrivu Neilai. Do it for me, meaning for God. Let go. Let go of our own self-interests. Do it L'Shem Shemaim for the sake of heaven. Ushmativ, and then you'll hear exactly what it is that needs to be done under those circumstances. That's another piece of advice from the Baal Shem Tov, uh, based on the Ramban. And you know, there's interesting, before I conclude, a story which I think drives the point home. One of the Belzer Rebbe's, Rebbe Yisachar Dov of Bells, had a son, Mordechai. And it was time for Mordechai to get married. He was of marriageable age. And so somebody came to the Belzer Rebbe and offered, uh, suggested a shidduch for Mordechai, the son of the Belzer Rebbe. Who made the suggestion? An Admor, a great Hasidic master, Reb Shlomo Chanoch of Radomsk. So it's not shocking that one Rebbe offers, right? The Radomska Rebbe says to the Belzer Rebbe, I've got a shidduch for your Mordechai. I've got a girl. Not only does she have yichos, oh, she comes from a prestigious family, but to, to, to boot, they're a wealthy family and the father's willing to give a huge dowry. So this is a great opportunity. The Belzer Rebbe refused it flatly on the spot, not interested. He turned it down before even exploring why. The Rebbe, the Belzer Rebbe, said to the Radomska Rebbe, he said, look, I don't want my son's first thoughts in the morning to be about business. I want his first thoughts to be, there is a creator. I want him to jump up and do the will of God. Now, the Belzer Rebbe then went to his son Mordechai and told him everything that happened. He said, I want you to know, Mordechai, the Radomska Rebbe came to me and offered a shidduch for you. She has from an illustrious family and a wealthy family. And I'm telling you, I turned it down flatly. And the Rebbe said to his son, you know why? I'll explain you. Why did I turn it down? He said to his son, when you get up in the morning, I want you to place your trust in Hashem for your parnasa. I want you to say mo da'ani from a place of humility and with a broken heart. I want you to know that you need Hashem's help for success. But... If you choose to marry into this wealthy family, your finances will be secured. And I doubt that you'll ever reach the spiritual heights I just mentioned. Wow, what a story. What a story. The Belzer Rebbe wanted his son to constantly yearn for Hashem's help. The Belzer Rebbe wanted his son to live up to the expectation of El Ha'aretz Asher Ar Eka. I'll bring you there. Keep yearning, keep longing, keep pining. Because this dependence leads to the goal. It's called Dveikos Pashem, L'chaim. So the practical application, we already said it, let's just say it again. That we find ourselves at crossroads. We find ourselves in doubt. We find ourselves in, in, in dilemmas and predicaments. So number one, number one, we should try to remove ourselves from the situation. Remove our own self-interests. Try to think, I'm out of here. I, I don't care anymore. I just want, what is Hashem's will? That's number one. And then we should say the following tefillah, the following prayer to Hashem. Dear Hashem, dear God, I am at a crossroad right now. I don't know what to do. So please forgive me for any past sins and bless me with the strength to withstand temptation in the future. Please, dear God, lead me in the direction that I am supposed to take just as you led my great-grandfather Avraham. That's the lesson that we're learning in a practical application from our parsha. So may we all be blessed with the presence of mind to invite God in, especially during times of uncertainty, and thus break any barriers between ourselves and Hashem by doing tshuva and by taking our selfish motives out of the equation in order that the veil of darkness be lifted from our eyes, enabling us to choose the right paths for us in the course of our lives and subsequently build our Amuna muscles which generate Dveikus Bashem and eventually return our souls to their maker with the satisfaction of knowing that we've accomplished the missions for which we've been sent down to earth. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos.